Welcome to another episode of How I Discovered My Gift with yours truly, David D. Simons. I'm honored, delighted, my excited, excited to have Anna Papalia on the show today. Let me tell you a little bit about Anna Papalia. She created what's called the Shift Profile, an industry-leading personality assessment that teaches job seekers and hiring managers how to interview better. Don't we all need that? She's the former director of talent acquisition and career. She's a former talent director and a career coach founded the shift profile in 2011 to empower job seekers with self-awareness and teach hiring managers that the most important business decisions are made in interviews. I can testify to that. A personal development keynote speaker, her inspiring talks teach empowerment and confidence through actionable tips and stories from her career on both sides of the interview table. Her thought leadership is sought after. She has personally worked with over 5,000 clients and conducted hundreds of corporate training sessions. So that's the official bio, but let me just tell you from my uh, friendship with Anna Papalia and, and knowing of Anna Papalia. So, um, we got a chance to meet, I want to say about a year or so ago, and um, she had this desire to really build up her social media presence. And, and, and she just, she, she told me something about herself that whenever she gets into something, she goes all the way in. And so she told us about the strategy she was going to do and really get onto TikTok. And she went after it completely that she has gone viral and not just viral once, continually viral and her TikTok is blowing up. So literally go to Anna Papalia on TikTok, on Instagram, on her reels. Um, I, I just admire her tenacity and I've learned so much in observing her and the work that she does. And she's just amazing at what she does. She's an amazing person, individual, just all the way around. So I just had to give you my personal bio <laughs> of Anna Papalia. Welcome to the show, Anna. <laughs> Thanks, David. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for that intro. No problem. No problem. So I want to I want to dive in. Let, let's let's take it through the journey, like from, you know, getting into this whole space of uh, talent and looking into talent and, you know, take us through the journey. Sure. Um, my journey um, was an interesting one. I think everyone's is. Um, I didn't go to college thinking that I was going to do this, and I certainly didn't think I was an entrepreneur. Those things revealed themselves to me. Um, I actually went to school for psychology. I thought that I was going to save the world and, you know, be a therapist. And I got my first internship in behavioral health, and I realized very quickly that it wasn't for me. And I got my second internship at a corporate HR department, and I thought. I, I like this, you know, this environment is a better feel for me. And I, I really look at my career and the way I develop my own gifts, like breadcrumbs that I sort of follow throughout my life. And I really liked, well, I was first in an HR generalist position, which I was not good at at all. I had to do paperwork, which I'm terrible at. I have no attention to detail. And I thought maybe I had made the wrong choice. And a couple months into it, the corporate recruiter put a bunch of resumes on my desk and said, you know, I'm overwhelmed. Can you help me like phone screen these candidates? And I didn't know the first thing about that. And I was like, yeah, sure. You're, you guys are going to pay me to like talk to people. Uh, absolutely. I'll do that. And I loved it. It was, it was love at first sight. I was really good at it. It was a great combination and intersection of my interest in psychology and my interest in HR and just making a, a good fit. I was like a detective going into the world and this is what we need. Go find it. And I knew kind of immediately that if I wanted to get really good at recruiting, I needed to go and work for recruiters and like learn how to do it. So I found a boutique recruiting firm in Center City, Philadelphia, and we recruited for accounting and finance professionals. I was there for about two years and they taught me everything. These guys were burnt out CPAs who had started their own recruiting firm. And they taught me everything, how to cold call, how to, you know, mine a database, how to persuade people. I learned what can what great candidates did, how they came across in the interview process. I learned everything. And it was hundred percent commission based. So I had to hustle and I had to call and I had to I had to be on the phone. And then um, I was very successful at that and I really liked it and I loved learning more my craft that I was falling in love with, which was recruiting. 
And then I was recruited into an organization to become their internal recruiter. So as an external recruiter, you work for a bunch of companies. And then I got rid- recruited to work for a company. And I was ready for that because I really missed partnering with like the internal hiring managers. Because when you're an external recruiter, you're just kind of like this mercenary. But when you're an internal recruiter, you partner with people, you get to know the organization. And I worked for a company that used to be part of Commerce Bank called Commerce Insurance Services. And they were just spinning out to be their own company, which is now Connor Strong, owned by George Norcross, if you're familiar in this area. And I... You know, I didn't know this at the time, but, you know, in looking back on my career, it was really showing me how to build a new company. It was tapping into these entrepreneurial tendencies I didn't even know I had. And I was there for a while. I got promoted twice. And ultimately, I ended there as a director of talent acquisition where I was responsible for hiring everyone, partnering with all the executives. By the time I left, I had hired over 80% of the employees there. And I loved my job. I loved the company. I loved my bosses. I loved everything about it. But there was this calling, this deep yearning. It was like, I could literally have stayed there for the next 30 years. You know, a lot of people that I worked with are still there. But I just felt a calling to do something much bigger than myself. And I quit my job without a job lined up. I walked into the president's office and I said, I have a dream. And if I don't do it now, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. I don't have kids yet. I have some money in the bank. I just have this weird calling that I need to teach people how to interview better, which doesn't exist really in the world. And I didn't have a business plan. I literally just had this intuition. And I remember leaving his office and thinking, what did I just do? What did I just do? And I took a couple months off and collected myself and then Uh, Temple University was my first client. They called me. I had previously hired all of our interns and built an intern program that I filled from their wonderful risk management department. That's really the best in the country. And the dean called me and said, you know what the students are doing right and wrong. We hear you're starting a consulting company teaching people how to interview. Come and do it here. And I did. I built a curriculum and I taught juniors and seniors at the Fox School of Business how to interview And for the first five years of my business, I was consulting with large companies to teach hiring managers, to teach executives, and then also teach students. And it was like getting a PhD in interviewing. I had been doing it, you know, as a position of power, as a recruiter and a director of talent on the HR side. So I had the credibility and the clout. And now I was doing it as a coach on the other side of the table. And now I was seeing how candidates did it. And I, I shifted my perspective and I had a light bulb moment. I, after five or six years of, of coaching and interviewing people, coaching people to interview, I realized we don't all do this the same way. And the way that we give people interviewing advice doesn't work. And how do I fix this? So I collected about a year and a half's worth of data at Temple University and I discovered interview styles. You know, we have love languages and Myers-Briggs and DISC and all these tools, but there's no tool to teach people how to interview. So I developed it. I rewrote it. I iterated it. And then in fall 2017, um, my first class back after summer, I had literally spent the summer writing the shift profile and making it perfect. I had all of my students take the personality assessment and reveal their interview style. And I'll never forget that moment. I was standing in front of the class. It's a vulnerable place to be. Everyone's opening their shift profiles and I'm thinking, oh, like, you know, this is, this is a real test. I, I had already tested on 200 people, but you know, God only knows what the, the students were going to say. And they opened it and they all said, this is amazing. I can't, how did you do this? This is how I am in an interview. And that's when I knew I nailed that moment in coaching to coach someone well, to lead someone well, you have to know who they are first. And that's what was missing in interview prep is that you have to diagnose someone before you can give them the cure. And that was the beginning for me. Um, So for about the next year and a half, I perfected it even more. I launched a website into the world. And uh, then COVID happened and I had all this research and all this data and I was just starting to build momentum in my company. And then all of a sudden, like everyone, I was, I just was here with a lot of time on my hands. And I thought, well, I've always wanted to write a book about all of this. Now is as good a time as any. Um, 
And I had so much time on my hands, but I also had two small kids at home because preschool was closed. So I wrote a book during nap times and when everyone was at, in bed and like stolen moments when the kids were at the playground, I, I wrote, I wrote this book I, and I wrote all about it. And then I got to a point where I was like, well, I don't know what to do with a book. So I got some great advice from you and other people to build my social media platform to attract an audience. And that's what I started doing less, just about a year ago. And we're just now in, in modern, my modern history. And that's where I have gotten. And at this point, um, as of today, I almost have a million followers on Facebook. It's 850 something. Yeah. At this rate, I'll be hitting a million by next week or the week after. Um, so it's been an incredible journey. Um, and I'm happy to dive into any aspects of that. But that's kind of the high level, um, my career path and how I got where I am now. Amazing, amazing. Um, thank you so much for breaking that journey down. Um, you know, in, in our discussions, you, you've shared there were some key moments where you realized the need for tools such as the shift profile. Um, can you expound on that? You know, I think it was a personal moment and there's also others as, as a hiring manager what, what, that, that kind of inspired the whole tool. Yeah, there, there were two moments. You know, the first moment was right as I was leaving Connor Strong as a director of talent. I remember a, a specific day, and I talk about this. I, I did a disrupt HR talk, which is kind of like a TED talk. And I talk about this moment where I had interviewed these three candidates for an accounting position, and I left those interviews feeling like, meh, I didn't really click with any of those people. And I remember going back to my office and just reflecting and sort of debriefing and thinking, why do I need to click with this person? Like, is that a requirement for the job? No, it's an, it's an accountant. You know, I'm not looking for a salesperson or someone who's client facing or someone has to build relationships. And that led me to a, a, a light bulb moment that I'll never forget that changed my career. I thought, am I, am I biased? Like in that moment, I was like, and this was years before, you know, the talk of biases in the HR process was as common as it is today. And I, I realized that if I looked back on the candidates that I had interviewed, not using that same, you know, bias, heuristic, that that unfair measurement I was using, that I wanted people to be like me, there was a good candidate there that would have been great for the job. We ended up hiring that person. And then the second moment that changed all of this for me was about three or four years into teaching at Temple. I was getting really frustrated. If you're a professor or teacher, you know this feeling. You, you formulate a curriculum. You try to teach everyone the same way. And some students just get it. And others don't. And I started to take it personally. And I was like, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they both? You know? And I went home. Um, my parents-in-law, uh, my aunt came out. And she is just an amazing person. And she gave me some insight that changed my, my coaching. She said, what if it's not the way you're doing it? You know, what if it's not what you're teaching? What if it's the way you're doing it? And I thought, huh, like, what if these students have a different style? And that was one of the big critical kind of parts of the thought process I had to go through in order to, to collect the data and see and back out from it. And to be honest from, with you, you know, there are so many times that I probably coach people wrong because they were highly introverted, you know, and we do that in the interview process. We tell people, because in our society, we prefer extroverts in interviews. So we tell people, open up, you know, that, you know, like be this thing. And that's really bad advice. Can you imagine in your life, if someone's basically telling you, don't be yourself, pretend to be something you're not and memorize answers, like that's just terrible advice. And I was coming up against that a lot with my students. And that's when I saw it. And when they first took their assess their, their, their profiles and they read them, and that's when they had that moment like, whoa, this is me. That's when I realized that the critical component in helping someone is diagnosing who and where they are. And then you can give them tips from there. So those are the, those are the two, two moments that really crystallize that for me, that we don't all do this the same way. And we need a tool that reflects our differences. Wow, that's beautiful. Can you expound on the shift profile? Somebody hearing this for the first time, because you've invented something that hasn't been done. And so you just go into into the two sides of, of the shift profile, what it does for the interview, the person that's getting hired. Um, and I just kind of dive on, on, on the whole tool. 
Absolutely. So we have two, two shift profiles, one for job seekers, one for hiring managers. The way you interview and your interview style is not dependent on what side of the table you're on. You, you are, you interview in one of four ways. You are either a charmer, a challenger, an examiner, or a harmonizer. Now, anyone can go on my website and take the interview style assessment. It's 20 questions. It's going to tell you what your interview style is. And then the entire shift profile is a 40 page customized document to you. So the first 10 pages outlines exactly how you are in an interview. Let's say you're a harmonizer and you prioritize adapting. You look at an interview like a tryout for a team that you wanna join. It's going to outline your approach and style, give you pre-interview um, coaching exercises to think about, and then 30 pages of interview questions to prepare, what to do in an interview, questions to ask if you get an offer, cover letter. I wanted this to be everything, right? Diagnose what your style is, and then give you tips, tools, tricks, coaching tips, and actual resources. Um, we're really proud of it, and I hope people that get their shift profile, you know, trust it and use it as a valuable resource. I know my students, you know, I went from having this just like 16 page handbook that I wrote to then when I developed the shift profile, I would always be like, why are, it's all in your handbook. Why aren't you reading it? No one read that handbook, right? And now the shift profile, since it's customized to you, your name's throughout it, and it feels like it's written for you. And that, that's the point and that's the intent. How do you interview and how do you get better? So how can somebody, let's just say they're going for a job interview and actually this is, this is ironic. My wife's going for a job interview uh, and following you, by the way, and li listening to all your tips. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're going for a job interview. Um, how can they leverage the profile to, is it to help them understand how the interviewer is going to be and what they have before them? Like, what's the way that that job seeker can leverage it to, to help them land that job? That's a great question. Like, why does it matter? Why do you care what your interview style is, right? So your interview style is going to give you insight and self-awareness. So I always say, and from my vast experience on both sides of the table, an interview in the most basic sense is a set of questions about you. The more you know yourself, the better you know yourself, the better you'll do. So if you know that your priority in an interview, let's say you're a charmer and you prioritize making a connection and getting liked, you know that you'll prioritize telling stories and making a connection. But what if the other person on the other side of the table is an examiner and they do not prioritize being liked, they prioritize getting to the facts and the details, they wanna hear your qualifications and this story you're telling them is just like getting in the way and annoying them. So you, you need to know, first off, to build your self-awareness to answer interview questions. And secondly, so you know how your interview style may conflict or get your wires crossed with others. Because here's the thing. Here's the, the revolutionary thing I, I, I found in my research. We don't all interview the same way, yet we all think that everyone interviews like us. So when you get your shift profile, you realize who you are. And then with my upcoming book, I outline all four of the interview styles. It's a much deeper dive, obviously. It's a it's a 250 page book that goes into and unpacks each interview style. Um, and that's my hope, to be honest with you. It's what I discovered in this process is I discovered how to be more open minded. I discovered how to understand that we need everyone and that not you know, especially in a recruiting space, you know, there isn't just one style that's that better at interviewing than others. And that understanding that knows that we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And together, we all make kind of the perfect team. Um, and that's my hope for anyone that watched my, my TikToks, my reels, my tips. I hope that I inspire people to understand that how you do it is valuable. You have your own strengths and weaknesses. How I do it might be a little different we may get our wires crossed, or perhaps if we work together, we'd be the perfect team. Beautiful. So, so I mean, the more I hear about what you've done and what you're doing, it really is a self-awareness -aware uh, tool, really, and, and everything that, helping that person to really understand themselves and understand others better as well. So I wanna take a step back a little bit and go to that place you were in when 
you realize this is my calling? What kind of self-awareness did you have at that moment? Because that's very risky for, for anyone, right? To, to leave um, a, a nice job that you have to start a venture where you, you didn't know it would be as successful as it is today. You had no clue. Yeah. And you took that leap and it worked out. But I just wanted, I want you to take us back to that mind state you're in and how, what self awareness discovery of yourself and who you are, did you have to go through to, to be able to make that decision? You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this last night in preparation for our conversation. You know, you emailed me, how did you discover your gift? And my immediate thought was, I don't know. Uh, I'm still discovering it. For me, it's a process of becoming. And I think I want to make this point to your listeners that for me, in making a brave choice to leave a company and leave a job, a safe job, and do something, you know, that I, it was, it is, it was very risky, right? And I, and I think this is the point that's, that's so important to make about a gift. For some people, maybe it comes as this lightning bolt of clarity, right? And sometimes, you know, and then all of a sudden everything works out. But that's never how it's really worked for me. For me, it's been a deep calling that feels like an intuition in my belly that I can't ignore. I just can't ignore it. And I have to then work really, really, really hard to mine it, to get better at it. Um... I think a discovering a gift for me means I found it through work. I found my personal gift through work. My personal gift is that I can empower others and I teach other people how to tell their stories in the context of a job interview. And I think the reason that's my gift is because it's what I do. It's who I am. Um, in writing the book about the interview styles, I weave my personal story and I moved out at 15. Uh, I had some tough circumstances as a kid and I got myself into college and I am a fighter. I'm really determined, as you said, at the top of the call. And, um, and for me, you know, I told that story in a college interview and that's how I was admitted into the University of Pennsylvania. An interview literally changed my life. So I know the power of an interview. I know the power of telling a personal story from a place of confidence and being empowered. And it's not a woe is me, I'm a victim. It's taking the power and, and, and mining the lesson that we all have been saddled with something in our lives. Every single one of us. Some people have disabilities. Some people are discriminated against. Everyone has something. And it's what you choose to do with that. And I think I, I definitely live a life. I talk the talk. I walk the walk because this is who I am. This is what I do. And I just simply teach people that part of it. That's my gift. I empower people to tell their own stories because I tell mine. And I think interviewing well requires us not to be something that we're not. It requires us to be us, to be who we are. As a thesis of my work, it's a thesis of my research and it's my gift. And I discovered it slowly and it doesn't come magically and then there's a lot of risk and there's a ton of uncertainty and there were there were years and years where I was just had my head down working where I was being ignored really by everyone um it wasn't until the last year and a half where my business really like took off you know there was there was years and years you know one of my best 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 girlfriends who I started my HR career with um, we're very close. And uh, she knew about this product and my book the whole time. And when I started to get all this media attention, and my TikToks were going viral, she texted me and she said, how does it feel to be an overnight sensation? LOL. And she said, I know it's taken you 10 years. Um, but I think that's a really important point to make to anyone who's, who's got their head down right now or wondering what their gift is. Like, you know, I'm 44. I just kind of like, synthesize and figured out what mine is it takes time mm, that, i'm so glad you mentioned this too because that's the next d that we talk about we talked about the discovery on you know, what you your gift is and empowering i think it's very very clear explanation of your and you said it, it took a becoming process to get to that point the next d which you're kind of already talking about is development right and this is the stuff that's done in the dark nobody sees all the 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 tears 
the, the pain, the blood, the sweat, the, the sweat equity that you put into a vision or the, the, um, the work that you had to do on yourself. Because one, you're, you're, you're following a calling. Two, you're bringing people along to a vision that you see and you're helping to help other people see your vision to impact other people. So there's a lot that you have to carry a, a weight uh, as a calling, but it is a weight of an entrepreneur. And then um, bringing people into that vision. Also, there's livelihoods on the other line of that as well. So if you could just speak to the, the development you've had to do as a person, as an entrepreneur, uh, as a leader, as a professional, what, what, what has gone into your development? Whew, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, who I am today, boy, oh boy, is it so different than what I was when I left my corporate job. These 11 and a half, almost 12 years of owning this business, I often equate owning a business or having this product as like being a parent, right? Um, it has changed me immeasurably. Um, it has demanded so much from me physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I am in completely different. And I think that moment I had when I quit my corporate job was a moment of intuition that I knew that if I was going to embark on this journey, this was going to be the thing that would bring me into my highest self. And boy, oh boy, did I sign up for something. It's like climbing Mount Everest. Like It's like becoming a parent. You don't know what you don't know when you start a business, you know? I didn't have a business plan. I didn't go to school for business. I, I just had a passion. I just had an idea. And, you know, I used to work with this consultant who would say, you know, if you work by yourself or own your own business, if you look in the mirror, you double your resources, <laughs> which is basically how it feels at the beginning. Like I remember I, I left my corporate job in April and it was tax season. I had to do my taxes. And I thought to myself, okay, where's the accounting department? And I was like looking around my home office and I'm like, oh, that's me. I'm the accounting department. I'm the marketing department. I'm the content creation. I'm the everything. And then, you know, that's the first few years. And then you develop a team and you hire people and then you get clients and it demands everything from you. Who, who I, what my job looks like now is so vastly different than what it looked like five years ago. And vastly different than it looked like five years from that. And five, I always look at my career in five year increments. Like I was at Temple and like slogging away with my head down and teaching three workshops a week and doing, you know, 500 resume reviews and, you know, mock interviews and just doing the work, getting that PhD. And then, you know, five years after that, I was developing this product and writing a book. I think careers can be seen in these smaller increments of time and then it kind of clicks over and then, you know, it changes in the corporate world. We get promotions, we change our job descriptions. Um, and quite literally it, it has demanded everything from me and I have changed almost entirely. You know, they say that your cells in your body change over every seven years. <laughs> That's how it feels being an entrepreneur. I'm totally, I do completely different things now. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Because I don't think people get the uh, the inside scoop of really what it takes. To, you know, it's this sexy, flashy thing to become an entrepreneur, but there's, they don't really understand the 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 demand it takes on a person. So um, we, we you know we can't have you on and not talk about marketing and and social media and all the amazing things you're doing in that. Which brings us to the last D, which is distributing. Right. Um, it's you could have the best tool in the world, which I think Shift Profile stands in a class of its own. Mm -hmm. I personally used it and um, I actually have some hiring to do. So I'm going to go back and do <laughs> my materials. Um, but you can have the best tool in the world. And I think you know this. You have the best tool in the world. But if you don't have any marketing, you can have the best jump shot, uh, tennis swing and, and whatever, whatever industry, whatever thing you're doing, be the best at world class in it. But if you don't have marketing around it, it's going to be hard uh, for it to take traction and go to the places and levels it could be. Can you talk to us about just because you're obviously a marketer, um, you're obviously a content creator, 
um, talk to us about the marketing journey of what you built up in your you know brand personally, uh, TikTok, social media, and and even before before all that from a marketing perspective too. Well, I am flattered that you would call me a marketer. I am not. I am not. I am not. I, I'm terrible at it, actually. I don't have a marketing brain. I don't. I have a, I am really good at what I do. That's it. And I think the reason that my TikToks and my Facebook Reels work is because I'm really passionate about this and I offer tips and tools that people can absorb really quickly in an easily digestible 30 seconds or minute and a half. I have always, it's sort of part of my personal, it's just who I am. I, I always want to inspire people and tell them, you know, how they can become empowered with tools. So it's part inspiration and part pragmatic tips. Now, I, I don't, you know, how will you market that? You know better than me. Um, what I'm doing is I'm being myself completely and totally. And I have been doing this for 10 years. Now I'm just doing it in front of my phone, recording myself, and then, you know, popping it on the inter internet. Um, I also know that how it works for my business, and this might help your audience, is it's top of the funnel for me. Um, it builds credibility. It gets the distribution out there. And... It is who I am. It, it, it gets me out in the world in a very real and authentic and genuine way. And that I am very proud of. I am who I am on those videos. Like there's, you know, I don't pretend to be something I'm not. Like if, if you know, people hire me from these videos, they're like, oh, you know, I feel like I'm talking to your TikTok. You know, like I, I want that to be the case. So I think those are some of the reasons how it works for me. Um, I don't. I can't apply what I do to other people's businesses and that way I am not a marketer. I don't do what you do. I'm not good at that. I am just simply doing what I do in short, digestible ways to get people to come to my website. It's top of the funnel. And then from there, um, they can hire me as a coach. They can get a shift profile. They can take a resume class that we offer and then soon they'll be able to buy my book. And it's all the same platform. It's all the same thing. You know, it's all interviewing tips. It's all I do. It's a very defined niche, which I also think is very important for people on social media. Um, there are so many people on social media. So I think it's important that you know who you are and have a voice and say something. Like, don't be afraid. Like, I think a lot of people get on social media and they're afraid and they're like, just kind of like put their toe in. Like, that's, you know, they're out hundreds and thousands of people creators on TikTok saying stuff you got to say something in order to get some attention um i recently had a, a video on TikTok go sort of mega viral and it got global attention um called five things you should lie about in an interview and that's a really catchy great marketing title um but the advice is really solid right like i'm not encouraging people to be dishonest i'm saying there's some things that you shouldn't share in an interview and hear what they are um so yeah that's just what i do i don't i don't know the marketing piece of it i just know what i do you're doing a great job at it that <laughs> video uh, as a check as of today is like 4.1 million uh, crazy. views on tiktok and i'm sure it's on that on on instagram and other platforms so um but i think what we take from what you've shared and is, is being authentic right that's what it boils down to uh, people are attracted to authenticity the um, large brands like a like a rihanna has fenty beauty is built off authenticity so i think that that's something that our, our listeners can take away is you know hey you might be scared to jump on tiktok instagram all these platforms but being authentic and, and you said another word you said and it's it's ironic I, I got this from listening to another podcast interview about passion and uh and there's a definition of passion that everybody knows that passion is you know what excites you and, and brings you joy but the other definition is the second definition which actually means what are you willing to suffer for oh. that's the second part of passion yeah. and i like I that never realized that right and so what you just know that there's there's a suffering that you've had to go through to bring out something that you're passionate about in in the world of of HR and, and this whole tool. So kudos to you in that. And, and I just, just want you to share maybe with others of 
like where 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 what's next and what what can people how can people get connected? Of course, we're gonna plug all the all the links and places where they can get to to get the shift profile and other resources that you have available. Thank you. I love that piece about passion. That really, I felt that in my heart. It's so true. You, I say to people all the time about jobs. You know, working is hard. Relationships are hard. So pick something that you love because you'll be more engaged and you'll and you'll stay up late at night and you'll wake up early in the morning and you'll be willing to do it because you love it because you you there is a piece of suffering in passion um for me i am um obsessive impatient and hyper determined um and for me um what's next is starting a global conversation around how we interview making this a more humanistic approach educating everyone on the interview styles so we can all do this better. I want hiring managers to make better hires. I want us to you know bend the arc of these corporate cultures and structures to the arc of justice where they should be and make our cultures reflect our our co company cultures reflect that of all of society. Uh, I want people to hire based on skills and need, not based on just because they like someone. For me, the next five years looks like um, getting this word out on a massive scale so people feel validated, recognized, and appreciated in the interview process. And that is not how people feel right now in the interview process, both hiring managers and job seekers. And I'm doing something different in my book that's coming out. I'm writing to both job seekers and hiring managers. And there aren't book, there aren't many books, you know, written to hiring managers on how to interview. There's lots for hiring for interview for job seekers that say things like there's just two types of books, like very specific ones, like how to land your flight attendant interview, or um, books like, you know, memorize these perfect answers to get the job. And I, I want to start an entirely new conversation. I want this to be revolutionary. You know, the four interview styles is just like your five love languages. How do you do this? And how do other people do it? Um, people can connect with me. First of all, Shift Profile, our website, is an excellent place to start. They can understand um, uh, the product a little deeper and get their own shift profile there. And then from there, follow me on TikTok and Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, anywhere you get your social media content, it's the same. We put the same videos on all of the channels and connect with me there. If you're looking to prep for an interview and you need a session, you can hire me for a one-on-one -on -one session through that website, shiftprofile.com. And if you're really excited about all this and you have a shift profile and you want to know more about it, my book will be coming out pub published by HarperCollins this time next year. We don't have a publishing date. Uh, we will have a pre-sale link here soon. I am literally putting the final touches on my manuscript as we speak. It's pretty exciting. Oh, that is so awesome. Congrats on that. Definitely. We'll make sure to, to as the, the book comes out, let us know. We're going to continue to push that uh, when the book comes out. But um, um, definitely we'll make sure to plug the, the, the link for people. Um, a question I always, we always ask listeners, I mean, interview, on interviews is, what's the difference between one's gift and one's purpose, Anna? What's the difference between one's gift and one's purpose? I can't speak for anyone else, but I know for me, there is no difference. It's totally intertwined. Um, I feel as though I've been given this gift to fulfill my purpose. Mm -hmm. I feel as though I have this gift. I feel as though all of the experiences in my life have created me and built and given me these skills and experiences to be this perfect combination of things that my gift requires of me. And, you know, and this is how I fulfill my, like I said before, being my highest self, my highest calling. How do I become the best version of myself? It's by mining these lessons and childhood trauma and all the things that happened to me. And it's by understanding I have this great innate skill and gift. I'm really good at interviewing on both sides of the table. What do I do with that? You know, at the end of my time in the corporate world, I kept thinking, you know, I, I feel like I have all these answers and solutions and I feel kind of gross not sharing them, you know, like 
I basically had judgment fatigue at the end of my corporate career. I was like so sick of judging people for a living every day. I wanted to get on the other side of the table. And I, so often, you know, in my corporate career, I was, call, I was like making someone an offer on the phone and they would just accept the first offer. They didn't negotiate. And I just wanted to jump through the phone and be like, what are you doing? You know, always negotiate. Or I would get, you know, thousands of resumes and I would spend time with candidates, like telling them what they needed to change and how they needed to update their resume. <laughs> and, you know, my old coworker would hear me all the time and she'd be like, I can't believe you spend so much time helping that person with their resume. I'm like, well, who else is going to? And that was part of my passion in coming out of the corporate world. I was like, I was just so sick and tired of like having all this knowledge and no one helping these people and no one doing this. And I live by the mantra, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I looked around, I was like, no one is doing that. No one's teaching people how to interview. My hiring managers have never been trained. These job seekers are unprepared. I'm sitting here with all the answers. If I don't do something, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. That's my passion in combination with my gift. And clearly I'm very passionate. You'll never meet anyone that's more passionate about interviewing than me. I think that's required no matter what you do. I mean, you could do anything, right? Marketing, it doesn't matter. Be the best lawyer you are in a, a very specialized niche. If you're passionate about it or you find something that you just love so much, model trades, I don't know, whatever it is, um, that's what's going to make you successful. I really believe that. That and showing up every day and making tough choices. Those are the things that make me successful and the combination of my gifts and my passion and my purpose. That's how it intersects for me. Beautifully stated. Um, Anna, is there anything I didn't ask you about that uh, you feel listeners should hear? Could be on the job seeker side could be on the hiring and it could just be just general listeners to to hear anything that is on your heart that people should hear you know i i think that this was a, a lovely and thorough conversation i think it's important that people understand in discovering a gift or in interviewing better we often avoid failure we avoid uncertainty because it feels scary um, and I hope one of the messages your listeners get from my story is that every single time I made a change in my life, I stepped into complete uncertainty. There was nothing there that there was no net and you have to do that. And interviewing feels like that as well, right? Often we avoid the things that are going to give us our best lessons. The great saying, the cave that you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. We fear putting ourselves out for a promotion or looking for a new job. And we're worried about failure. We're worried about being embarrassed. We're worried about being ashamed. And I'll tell you one thing from my personal life. I have failed so many times. I've made so many mistakes. And every single time I come out of it thinking, wow, I'm braver. I'm smarter. I'm wiser all because of that failure. I learn more, and I think we all do from our failures than we do our successes. But it's very weird that we try to avoid failure all the time. We try to put it out there. We try to limit and take less risks. When risks and failure are the very thing that you need to learn what you're made of and to get you where you need to go. And I hope everyone sees that. And I think ultimately when you've decided and you're fed up and you want a new job or something has clicked for you that's a big part of it you know you have to be sick and tired of something before you take a risk into the unknown um, but as you get older it's, it's easier to take some of those risks I think if you start to learn that if you look back on your own life and ask yourself what did I learn from my successes probably this much you learn two or three things what did I learn when I failed Whew, man I learned so much when I failed so much wow that's good wow you you um, tied that with a bow beautifully, <laughs> um, Anna. Just thank you so much for all you do and the example you're living for all 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 of us to follow in pursuing our purpose, pursuing our gifts, pursuing our talents. And um, I, you know, I'm just I'm rooting for you. I'm excited for you. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Truly, truly an honor. And I know listeners are going to be blessed by this episode. Well, I have to just say at the last moment here that I want to thank you for being one of those people in my journey who helped me 
you know, you, you see, there's always people along the way that like say something that gets your attention. And we met about my marketing needs and social media. And you said to me, you know, you should really check out TikTok. <laughs> you should, you know, video format is like the future for people that do what you do. And your way was just so helpful. And there was that moment and you were that person that helped me, that guided me in that moment where I had been resisting doing this thing. Just like I just said, I had been resisting going into the cave that hold, held the treasure that I sought. And I want to thank you publicly for, for being that person, for just guiding me just a little bit. I think that's an important part of this as well. If you want to discover your gifts and give back, you have to pay attention to the signs that you get, to um, the people that are there along your journey. And we can be resistant for so long, but if you keep getting the message and you keep getting the sign and everyone keeps telling you, get on TikTok, then get on TikTok. <laughs> so you were one of those people and you really got my attention, to be honest with you. You were the one that clicked it for me and I appreciate that. So humble, so honored by those kind words. And, you know, you, you do the work though, right? Most people don't do it, you know, and you've yeah. done the work, you put in the work. And so... Uh, that's that's what's going to happen when you yeah the that's work. that's the difference yeah <laughs> yeah you could do the work yeah it's 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 all fine and good when someone says oh yeah get on tiktok and then you start making three to five videos a day and you get low views and then you get mean comments and to keep going through that and have perseverance and be determined and know that like if i keep doing this because I do know one thing for sure if you do something every single day you will be successful it's almost mm -hmm. guaranteed but if you just like, you know, kind of put your toe in, you don't really do it and you only do it for a couple of weeks, like, of course, it's not going to be successful. Of course, it's not. You got to keep going. You gotta dive in. Thank you like so you much for having me. Oh, thank you. Like your word, obsessed. You got to obsess about it. You got to be. I mm -hmm. love it. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Anna. This is an amazing interview. We learned so much personally. I know the listeners are going to be blessed by it, too. I hope so. Wonderful. It was so good um, to see and talk with you. And um, I hope you're well.